Saudi Arabia was actually uh, the first Arab state to put normalization with Israel on the table. We are also gratified by the keen interest you are maintaining in the establishment of a comprehensive, just and lasting peace in the Middle East. This is Najma Minhas and with Bezada with GVS Dialogue. Today we're looking at this increasing talk about Saudi Arabia's normalization of relations with Israel. With what is the reality behind this? Um, a, a lot is being discussed about it. Um, we don't know it from Saudi sources or the Israeli sources. We principally know it from the American sources, which are also Jewish sources, sources which are within Israel, sources within uh, which are within the U.S. administration, sources like Thomas Friedman. Uh, uh, the New York Times columnist, who is actually very close to Biden administration, he wrote a piece three weeks ago uh, in which he described it as a, a win-win situation for all sides. He described it as a, going to be uh, a breakthrough bigger than the original um, Camp David Accord of the 1970s when Egypt and, uh, Egypt and Israel came close, as a result of which uh, the Sinai was returned back uh, to Egypt and Egypt and Israel became friends and the United States uh, is still giving something between $3.5 billion to $5 billion uh, every year to, to right. Egypt uh, and uh, and thus Israel was made secure. So he describes it something very big that's about happening and he's very optimistic. But everyone else, which I have read from the Israeli side and the American side, mm -hmm. uh, have expressed a lot of doubts and reservations. Uh, they think it's going to doubts be... Doubts over what? About it happening? Uh, the, basically, the thing that uh, the three sides and the huge expectations. Uh, so will United States be able to fulfill these expectations uh, of both the sides? And what is that is for the Biden administration? Uh, because this is not going to be something that is going to help. Uh, it can be a, a huge foreign policy success for Biden uh, in an election year. We are we're, we're kicking an election year. But at the same time, as you can also now see after living in the U.S. for almost nine, ten months, uh, when we used to live in Pakistan, people used to uh, fret about uh, that the Americans don't really care about Pakistan. I mean, Paki the Americans don't even care about Israel that much. I mean, the common American is not really concerned. Well, relatively. In the sense, APAC has a huge political, I mean, it's a huge political. Yes, it has. I mean, the, the influence of the APAC is within the uh, specialized power circles of, uh, of the House of Representatives, of the Senate, within the White House, uh, within the media. And so on. I mean, but the common American who has to vote in the election uh, uh, has other issues that on. What on is really mind. driving the U.S. then? Why why are they keen on doing this? Because I know that in June, for example, Antony Blinken put, said that this is a national security interest for the United States, the normalization of of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Within the uh, first of all, within the power elites of the U.S. system, mm. uh, Israel is very important. But there's a long history. I don't want to go into it. The immediate, uh, the immediate stimulus is, uh, the, this, is the posting of the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman MBS. I think the biggest thing which the Americans want from Saudi Arabia is that Saudi Arabia should limit its relationship uh, with China. Right. Uh, the talk of uh, Saudi selling oil to China in exchange of the Chinese currency Yuan or NB, RNB, me or whatever it is called, yes. and uh, um, and uh, and not relying upon the dollars, uh, the growing relationship between the Saudi uh, economy and the Chinese uh, technology giants like the Huawei, these right. are the principal considerations. And then, of course, the foreign policy consideration, the security of Israel, 
Uh, Does even talk about the fact that the U.S. has asked Saudi Arabia uh, not to allow Chinese military bases as well. No, I haven't seen this. I have read as much as I could from different sources, but I haven't seen. Um, uh, so it's the general general strengthening of Chinese influence in that region, which you're saying that the United States is very worried about. You see, in the last couple of months, um, China, I think it was in March that it became obvious that China has played a constructive role in bringing in final paw between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And since then, the Saudis and Iran have sort of engaged each other. There a lot of been... Uh, mutual meetings, ministerial level uh, discussions, and both the foreign ministers of Saudi Arabia and Iran, I believe, were actually in in China as well a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago. Uh, so uh, this unnerves Washington. This clearly unnerves Washington. Uh, Israelis are also unnerved by it. I mean, Israelis, before it became visible uh, that Saudis and Iranians are prepared to engage each other, uh, Israelis had invested a lot in engaging Saudi Arabia. In fact, um, uh, the, the forward progression of the Abrahamic Accord between UAE uh, and, and Israel, in which then Bahrain also came along, and then there was softening from Qatar as well. Uh, all of that when it was happening, uh, it was expected that Saudi Arabia would also come around. But then Saudi Arabia instead actually goes and embraces uh, Iran, uh, and that was uh, considered dangerous and problem uh, and problematic from the Israeli point of view. And I've seen a number of pieces in, from the Israeli uh, ex-policy makers, columnists, they think that this is something uh, Israel is not getting anything. I mean, Israel has actually lost a great opportunity. What What do the Israelis want from the Saudis? I mean, what's driving them to get this uh, normalization? Uh, the Israeli president was in the United States to about a month, month and a half, six weeks ago. And he said that this is an extremely important uh, event if it happens, this normalization. So, so the Israelis are obviously somewhat keen on on that, this normalization happening. What is driving them? You see, um, Israelis are of course very keen, um, and I will come to why the Israelis are keen. I mean, the, the Israeli keenness is obvious, but um, I think the main driver is actually in Saudi Arabia. And Saudis actually want too much from uh, Washington. Uh, they want everything from Washington. I mean, they're not, want, they're, they're not looking for anything from Israel. That's a funny thing. Uh, because in the Muslim world, you expect that Saudi Arabia will actually be giving something to get something for uh, uh, for Palestinians or for the Arabs. Mm -hmm. But uh, Saudi Arabia wants at least three main things from Washington. Uh, and these so are the... Saudi Arabia is working for itself, not the Palestinians. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. definitely. I mean, Palestinians are nowhere. I mean, Palestinians are nowhere. In fact, if, uh, if Palestinians are anywhere on the mines, this is actually on the uh, minds of the Israeli left and uh, they're on the minds of the Americans. So, uh, w uh, so Saudis want three big things. Um, uh, and, and if these things don't happen, then nothing happens. First of all, they actually want uh, Washington to give them a civil a nuclear reactor, right. uh, a nuclear cooperation. Uh, they want uh, them to give them the fuel. And they also want to give them the facility for the uranium enrichment within Saudi Arabia, point one. Second, they want... Um, Ironclad security guarantees, a security, a mutual security pact uh, between Riyadh and Washington, mm -hmm. a pact that is on the um, uh, on the fashion uh, of the NATO. Uh, they refer to clause five of the NATO, in which any attack on Saudi Arabia will actually be considered an attack on uh, U.S. and U.S. will have to come uh, to attack of uh, to the help of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not mentioning Iran, but it's obvious that the, the Iran is on their mind. Um, is, this, is this pact similar to what Pakistan in the six, 50s and 60s had with the U.S. with the CETO CENTO type pacts? Well, Pakistan, um, uh, it never materialized. Pakistan never got anything out of it. Pakistan got some defense cooperation. Pakistan expected that any kind of attack or any kind of war with Pakistan right. uh, will be considered, will actually get but the U.S. help. The pact that it signed did actually have that assurance, right? So even if they... No, 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 no. We're going in the wrong direction. Let me first of all... So the CETO Center was basically um, um, Pakistan was to get the U.S. help in case of an aggression from a communist country. Right. Uh, and the test of the uh, the whole test, uh, the whole thing was tested in 1965 uh, when Pakistan expected that the United States would at least give them the uh, political support. But when the war happened, uh, United States basically switched off all military aid to Pakistan right. and India, which was meaningless uh, because India was not reliant upon U.S. military oh. aid. And United States insisted that Pakistan CETO Center, whatever it was, was only for communist aggression. Right. But, you know, let me, no, 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 no. But let me go, come back to the third point. There's a third point for the Southeast. The NATO style pact, one. Uh, second, they want them to have a nuclear cooperation with them. 
Uh, and there is a third. Uh, 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 there is a third thing as well. They want um, natural style cooperation, the nuclear cooperation. Um, yes, they want access to the most latest, advanced U.S. Uh, defense equipment, the military equipment, uh, and their focus is on the terminal style anti ballistic missile system. In fact, they want a missile theater system to protect Saudi Arabia. And now there are reasons for it. The reasons for it that in 2018 or 19, uh, in the eastern Saudi Arabia, where most of their oil installations are based, they had uh, faced missile attack, which was which they believe is why the Iranian proxies. Iran was not directly responsible, but they thought the Iranian proxies were responsible. Right. So these are the minimum three things. So unless the Saudis get these three things from Washington, uh, they're not really interested in anything. I mean, this is what they want. In return, uh, they are prepared to uh, to accept and recognize Israel. So Israel gets something out of Saudis. Saudis want a huge favor from Washington. Uh, what Washington gets then in return are three things. Washington wants Saudis. But how likely is the Washington to give Saudis what they're asking for? Because both these things, uh, especially the, the, the mutual uh, security pact and the high arms that they're asking for, requires approval by Congress. And in 2021, Joe Biden himself limited the type of arms that could be sold to Saudi Arabia because of what they were doing in Yemen at the time. Um, so how likely is this to pass in the United States, I I assuming that the White House is even in favor? It's too complex. It's too complex because all the readings which I've seen, um, apart from Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist, who's very influential, I mean, it's almost like an intellectual motor force within, within Washington politics. Uh, uh, he thinks that, you know, this is a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. uh, every other American analyst is very, very cautious. I mean, they actually think that uh, too much is being asked from United States. United States is not getting much in return. Um, uh, almost all American analysts are also very sympathetic to the Israeli left. They're very sympathetic to the process of democracy in Israel. Uh, they're very worried the way Netanyahu government has dealt with the U.S. Uh, for, sorry, with the Israeli Supreme Court. Uh, and they actually worry that if uh, if Netanyahu gets from Saudi Arabia uh, a recognition for itself and the Americans help him in getting it, then Netanyahu and his Likud party and his hardliner alliance will get far too strong uh, against the Israeli democracy. And they're actually worried uh, that uh, if, if nothing is obtained for Palestine, this is very complex actually. Well, isn't, the, isn't the counter to that argument the fact that um, the Netanyahu passes this, um, is able to achieve the uh, normalization of relations. It enables the center, center left parties within the Israeli system to start supporting Netanyahu, which they can't do right now. And therefore, well, look, threatening look, Israeli. Look, you see, it's, it's actually very complex. I mean, that's why I use the word complex. It's very complex because the American policymakers, while they love Israel, are also not in a great love and romance with the Israeli right. So they're very skeptic of the direction the Israeli right is picking up. So they want the power of the Israeli right and the ultra-nationalists and the ultra-religious to be diluted. And the thing that can be diluted if the Israeli government is compelled uh, to agree that there will not be any more annexations on the West Bank, with no more annexations. In fact, they also demand that Israel should actually go back to the 2005 agreement where the Israeli then government had agreed that all illegal settlements that have been made on the Palestinian land would be returned back. Now, this is no, but once again, it's a very, very strange situation because by insisting that uh, the Palestinian land should not be annexed, the American analysts want the Netanyahu to break its coalition with the ultra hard wingers and to come into an alliance with the left-wingers and the central-right parties mm. uh, so that there's a more balanced government in Israel. So the American analysts are worried that the way Netanyahu is going, if Netanyahu is rewarded with the, uh, with the Saudi recognition, which they then think that once the Saudis recognize Israel, they will very easily compel Pakistan and even Indonesia. And by the way, Israelis are more interested in Indonesia than in Pakistan. Now, Pakistan has reached a point where Israelis are not even interested in the Pakistani recognition uh, after receiving the UAE, the Bahrain, good relationship with, you know, uh, Qatar. I mean, they think that whole Muslim world is about to fall. And so the American analysts are worried that if Netanyahu's hardline government 
is rewarded with such a big thing, that means that will be practically be the end of the Israeli democracy movement. So they're actually not worried for the Palestinians. They're worried for the Israeli democracy movement. But since they're worried for the Israeli democracy movement, they're also emphasizing upon the Palestinian two-state solution, no more land annexation. I mean, a good deal for the Palestinians because the deal means empowerment of the Israeli left and the Israeli center, and that means empowerment of the Israeli democracy. And the American system is wedded with the Israeli democracy. They're very worried by this ultra-religious, ultra-nationalist and you know religious orthodoxy in Israel. I mean, how, how do you how do you think the deal would be perceived on the Arab street? I mean, we've seen from 1979 uh, when Anwar Sadat signed the Camp David Agreement. Two years later, he was assassinated for that particular agreement. To now 2020, when the Abrahamic Accords happened, they were accepted. Um, how do you perceive this uh, changing uh, street uh, importance? In Two the aspects movement? are very important here to understand. One, the Arab street in the last uh, two, three decades has been crushed very badly. So the, uh, the elements that actually were responsible or that actually took the initiative of the assassination of the then Egyptian dictator and president Anwar Sadat, the Muslim Brotherhood. And you see the Muslim Brotherhood subsequently wanted legitimacy, they won an election, they formed a government of Mohammed Morsi, and then what happened to them uh, in uh, in August of, uh, or I think it was 14th of August uh, 2013, 10 years ago, how almost like anywhere between four to 10,000 of them were basically massacred in one single day by the Egyptian army. So, um, and this is more or less the situation of the uh, the Islamist or the Arab street in different parts of the Arab world. However, having said this, uh, the American analysts actually uh, think that uh, while MBS is not very sensitive to the Palestinian needs, he's young, he's brash, he's thinking of other things, but his father, uh, King Salman, mm. uh, is very sensitive to the Palestinian needs. He understands. They think they refer to him as the traditionalist, and perhaps this is not the right expression. Maybe he's more wiser than his son. And he thinks that you know something has to be, something big in terms of optics has to be obtained for the Palestinians. Uh, if the Saudis don't obtain something very visible for the Palestinians, then it's not going to go well for the Saudis across the Arab world. Now, what is the big thing? Apart from the no more annexations, no more settlements, uh, and a two-state solution, King Salman and the people close to him would like uh, 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 would like to basically uh, two things. Uh, they would like to have a Saudi role in the management of Jerusalem. Now, here becomes the tricky part, because Israeli uh, center and right of the center want Jerusalem, the whole of Jerusalem, uh, as a capital of Israel, which they have actually moved as well. Uh, and the East Jerusalem uh, and the PL and the Palestinians had, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, sort of access to the East Jerusalem, or they want you know, the Palestinians want of a fully independent, autonomous state to have East Jerusalem as their capital. Now, mm -hmm. Saudis want. Not only that the East Jerusalem should be the capital, they want East Jerusalem uh, religious sites to have some sort of uh, Saudi supervision uh, and, and a Saudi role in that, right? Uh, uh, so if they, if they get these things, they think that they will be able to sell, that they have extracted a huge thing for the Arabs, for the Muslims, and for the Palestinians. And Americans expect, uh, apart from the China thing, that they want Saudis to move away from China, they want an end to the Yemen war, but they also want that the Saudis should generously uh, help the Palestinian Authority uh, in terms of making it a more functional Palestinian Authority, a two-state solution. Now, coming to Pakistan, what would a normalization between the two countries mean for Pakistan? Pakistan gets nothing. I mean, Pakistan um, has lost its opportunity because once the uh, key Arab states, I mean, now the things have literally reached that stage where Saudi Arabia uh, is seriously uh, trying to engage Israel. In fact, Saudi Arabia is engaged with Israel. I mean, what we're looking at... For a decade, they're, they're having meetings after meetings. They're doing a lot of work together. Yes, yeah, so many things. Many things are going on. I mean, in the sense that uh, what we're talking right now, what I and you have talked in the last several minutes, is actually a formal um, Israeli, a formal Saudi recognition of Israel and then Saudi Arabia helping with the other countries. P Pakistan, as I have said in many of my vlogs and tweets uh, for the past several years, missed a huge opportunity uh, uh, when in the early 
90s, when India took the initiative towards uh, Israel, if Pakistanis had even quietly taken an initiative of engaging and normalizing and leveraging with the Israelis, they could have then done a huge favor to the Israelis and to the West by bringing along, by using their influence in the Muslim world, by bringing along uh, the countries like Saudi Arabia, by softening the attitude toward Israel. But Pakistani Foreign Office, and I would say, despite the fact that these days I'm actually being seen as a huge um, critic of the Pakistani military, but I mean, to be honest, I think there's much evidence to suggest that the Pakistani military, the GHQ, uh, seriously mulled over it, and they do realize, uh, and they had realized, that engaging Israel would actually uh, be, be good for Pakistan. Uh, but the Pakistan Foreign Office opposed it, apart from the fact that the Pakistani street, they thought it's very difficult to uh, to basically sell the idea of the Pakistani street. Uh, Does the Pakistan Pakistani street matter? Say it again. Does the Pakistani street matter? For it Pakistan? has often been described that the Pakistani street is very anti-Israeli. And I was speaking to a very, very uh, senior general a few years ago who was then the center of all authority, it was perceived to be central of all authority in Pakistan. This is almost like 2021, I think. And I asked him this question. I said, you missed a huge opportunity. And he took a deep sigh. And there was other people as well, equally senior. And the three of them agreed and said, we have, um, uh, we could not. I mean, they said, yes, we should have, but uh, we could not have, we couldn't have sold it to the Pakistani street. But I think that they haven't seriously analyzed that situation. The, uh, the, the response to my question was very honest and sincere. It was a private discussion. But I, I think that they uh, never realized this thing that had they made a determined, uh, uh, had they made a determination, what they determined, they could have sold it to the Pakistani street. I mean, whatever is being sold right now in terms of the domestic Pakistani politics, I mean, we always thought that such strange things um, it cannot be sold to the Pakistani street. And after all, to Pakistanis, Pakistan's domestic politics and prosperity is far more important. And they could have always, you know, got some goodies out of Israel and United States. If they had started engaging Israel in the early 90s, they could have obtained, uh, through the influence of the Israeli lobby, they could have obtained so many concessions in Washington, uh, in London, in the European Union. And I think that if I have to blame someone, I would blame Pakistan's foreign office. I think Pakistan's foreign office did not uh, demonstrate uh, the sufficient vision, because that was the opportunity. In in 90s, Pakistan was far more important to the Arab countries. It had far greater influence in Saudi Arabia, uh, in UAE, in Qatar, uh, in Bahrain, in Oman, uh, and it could have really worked uh, in a sustained fashion, and it could have been a huge benefit. Uh, I think some of the crisis which Pakistan met uh, in the later years, which we experienced the way Pakistani uh, Pakistani uh, strategic uh, uh, orientation has collapsed in front of India. The way it couldn't really handle the handle the gr growing American uh, pressures. All of these things would have been different uh, if Pakistanis had, had shown the leadership and the initiative in the early 90s. And it's it's very dear to my heart. I think Pakistan has made a huge loss. I mean, when I look at the present situation, uh, it's very sad. Well, there's so much happening on the Israeli front. I think there'll be lots of other discussions on this. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ashma. Thank you.